This is probably one of the most crucial parts of recruiting and talent right now. And I'll be candid with you, it's probably one of the biggest mistakes people are making. No more waiting through piles of shitty resumes. Say goodbye to exorbitant headhunter fees. Tell us about your ideal candidate. In just 10 days, we'll send you a shortlist of 10 hand-selected, perfectly matched candidates. Your first shortlist is half off. No credit card required. My guest is Abakar Saidov. Abakar is the CEO of a rocket ship growth company based in London called Beamery. Beamery helps companies that need to hire focus on identifying talent ahead of the curve, getting ahead of it, hiring them and spotting them before the day comes when Sally quits and you're like, oh shit, I got to backfill Sally. You're already too late. You're screwed. So Abakar and his team are trying to solve all this. His background reads like a who's who of anything. I mean, this, this guy is kind of intimidating. I will tell you, I'm a bit nervous. Goldman Sachs, Francisco Partners, one of the top PE firms in the world. Then he starts Beamery five years ago. He's built a team of over 100 people. He's raised over $40 million in capital to build this. He, this is a real, uh, a real business. And I'm really excited to welcome him because uh, he's going to hopefully set us straight. So, Abakar, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Jeff. I appreciate it. I'm thrilled to speak with you and learn from you. Uh, let's start at the top. Uh, which in my mind is just-in-time hiring doesn't work anymore. Uh, first question, do you agree or disagree? And, and maybe just give 60 seconds to the audience on what that even means to you. What is just-in-time hiring and why does it no longer work? So uh, I totally agree with you. And I think the, whether it works or doesn't, uh, context is important. So I think uh, in, in this case, uh, for the last two or three decades, organizations have hired in a way of, I have a job, here it is, let me go and find some people. And uh, until, you know, when it was a, an employer's market that worked, and uh, now it's increasingly become competitive in a candidate's market. So for example, if you're um, hiring high volume where you are the only big dog in the show and everyone wants to work for you, sure, it could work. Whereas if you're hiring for high skill, high demand um, individuals who have lots of other options, then how are you different to everyone else? Uh, that's part one. And part two is uh, your goal is to be able to um, have some kind of predictability and uh, strategy around how you build those roles. So what we've been seeing is organizations are starting to move from this reactive model of post jobs and pray people apply to a much more uh, proactive and strategic model of we need to be in control of our own destiny. And so, th so this is essentially what you're saying, it sounds like is it's CRM, right? It's just like you have customer relationship management, a funnel, a process to engage with prospects to turn them into customers to turn them into loyal customers you're kind of saying the same thing for candidates right yes well i mean the aha moment we had when we when we started our company was online you're not a candidate or a customer you're just someone browsing the web so surely the same kind of kind of customer lifecycle management so you have your leads you have your uh visitors you have people that become um prospects and prospects become opportunities and all of that stuff why does that not, why couldn't that work in recruiting? And the answer is, of course it can. Like a, a person doesn't care if, uh, how, you, how you think of them as an organization. What they care about is that they're getting value and they're building a relationship and they're engaging with your business. And so the way you build your customer brand can be the same way as you build your employer brand. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you, you're right, it, it is candidate relationship management, it is marketing automation, uh, and it's ultimately treating candidates like consumers. So if you are Amazon, Goldman, a handful of other companies, Google, mm -hmm. where you've got people lined up outside the door, like the mm -hmm. best in the class, the best in class lined up outside the door. This probably isn't your biggest priority and your biggest problem, right? Then, then your issue is how do you filter through all these people? Well, I, I'd actually disagree. So, uh, you know, we're we're very lucky to call some of those companies that you named uh, or, or companies like them as customers. And the the problem isn't just do I have good people coming to me. The problem then becomes. Uh, not just filtering them, but how do I make sure that they are actually uh, looking at the right time for the right opportunities? Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you are, uh, you know, one of the biggest recruiters in the world, you might have 3,000, 4,000 uh, talent acquisition professionals. Now, 
if you think about what your, if we go to kind of 50,000 feet, what are your organizational priorities? So you kind of have four stakeholders. You have your candidates, you have your recruiters, you have your employees, and you have your executives. So if you're trying to say, we're investing in business transformation, you're trying to create a better candidate experience, more efficient and productive recruiters, engaged employees who are part of the cycle, and then the executives want forecasting and planning, right? And so the ability to have something that kind of serves all those purposes, and so uh, as a very large organization, uh, your talent acquisition um, department becomes quite sophisticated. So for example, you have sourcing, which is like sales development. You have employer branding, which is like marketing. You have recruitment operations and executive search and internal mobility and referrals. And uh, all of those things are not resume processing. Those are actually now acquiring talent. And so you need something that is A, unifying the data, be unifying the experience the candidate is seeing and being able to then use all of that to drive uh, insights and predictability going forward. So here's where I'm stuck. Everything you're saying makes sense. My mm-hmm. company's 20 people, 50 mm-hmm. people, maybe 100 people. We're hiring, you know, some number of people, a dozen. Mm-hmm. How can I possibly make this a priority, build this infrastructure, hire a team of people to do all these things ahead mm-hmm. of the curve? I understand that once I get to scale and I'm hiring hundreds or thousands, sure. it makes sense, right? But in this adolescent phase, other than buying your product, which I'm sure is wonderful, and we'll <laughs> plug it at the end, sure. what, how, I still need to have people operating your software. I still need to have people meeting with candidates ahead of time. Totally. Um, yeah, so actually, the, the, you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, technology comes last. The first thing that happens is, is uh, the right people and the right processes. And so the, the biggest thing uh, to move from that reactive to proactive model is to start um, focusing on the acquisition side rather than the resume processing side. So, for example, having someone whose role it is to go out and build relationships with candidates uh, ahead of time. And so the, uh, like what is, like you're, you're not, if you, if you liken this to the customer model again, you're not sitting there waiting for people to buy things. Right. You're, you're starting to say our job is to go out there and build pipeline. And so it's not about just having the products that enables you to, uh, have that it. right? So, it's to say, um, I now have a, um, say a saucer or the, the job of the recruiter has changed. So if you, so my first, uh, if you're a 20 person company, my first recommendation is um, build a talent acquisition team earlier than you think. Because it's not at fifty or hundred people that you do need to do that. It, it's at twenty people. So let's talk. So let's get let's get real. Let's get very practical, Abakar. Let's say we have twenty employees. Mm-hmm. You're saying build a team. What, what does that team look like? How many people? How much is it going to cost me? And how does that scale when I get to fifty people or a hundred people? Mm-hmm. How many people are we talking about? Well, it depends really on your growth trajectory. So if you're twenty people and you're growing by five people. Um, and you're doing you know, one hire every three months, uh, it's, it's less about building a team, it's about probably making it more of a responsibility of every individual. So um, I spend probably 50% of my time on recruiting. And I think- 50%, that, five zero. Yes. And you're okay. adding, let's just do the maths, you're at 100, how many people, 125 people or something now? Yes, that's right. So, so we're, we're adding, adding about- How many this year will you hire? Probably about 100. So you're gonna hire 100 and you spend half your time on it as CEO? Correct. Yes. And I, and my expectation is that every one of my senior managers spends half their time on it because oh. it is so important, right? Like people are everything. And yep. obviously uh, it's, it's kind of a platitude, but uh, if people are everything, then you should be spending a, an appropriate amount of time on it. So that's the first step. If you're, if you're 20 people, then uh, every, it should be everyone's job to do that. And then you're starting to create that as part of the culture. So I think that's the biggest element is holding your, um, uh, people accountable to, if, if we need to grow, it is ultimately the hiring manager's uh, responsibility to ensure that growth happens. So even more important than this CRM strategy and engaging with candidates ahead of time mm-hmm. is just the commitment to spend the time on this, right? Correct, and, and the commitment to make this something that you discuss in your uh, staff meetings. So uh, recruiting performance metrics need to become something that is as important as your financial metrics, because if you're planning to grow, then it needs to be front and center. And as opposed to, what, what I think I heard you say in there is, as opposed to doing what most companies do, which is having people in time, spending time on inbound crap, job postings, over the transom people, sorting and filtering through things, just redeploy that time, right? Switch it, reinvest that time. So basically stop doing that and, and invest that time going outbound. 
Well, it, it depends on the stage. So typically, if you're a 20 person company, you do not have the employer brand to generate typically the type of quality of talents that you would want to hire at that point. And there are exceptions, obviously, but yeah. um, it's similar with sales. Like if you're a tiny brand, people aren't coming to you asking for your product. You're going to have to go out there and sell it. Yeah. So in this case, it's the same is until you become this uh, amazing brand that has got a lot of publicity that everyone wants to work for, you have to go out there and get those people. Bye. So let's talk about what that actually looks like. What are the few things that we need to do? I'm sure your software helps with it, but just conceptually, mm -hmm. when am I going out? To whom am I going out? What does even going out look like? Does that mean I'm going to networking events on Thursday nights at, at bars to meet candidates? Or where is the 80-20 that you've learned over the five years of doing this? Mm -hmm. that if I can nail this activity or a few things, it, it helps to reverse the, the funnel. Sure. So I'll give you some examples of what me and my co-founders used to do in our, in our early days. Um, we, the first part is obviously running a company, especially if you're um, a first-time founder or a CEO, it's, uh, you have a lot of things on your mind. And so saying, oh my God, I have to spend 50% of my time on recruiting. Um, what does it even mean? A lot of that time is eaten up by interviewing and all those things. So what we found really helps is time boxing things around sourcing. So uh, my co-founders and I would say we'd spend a couple of hours, uh, beginning of week, end of week, uh, on looking at you know angel list, LinkedIn, GitHub, et cetera. And, finding profiles of people that we found uh, were relevant and actually messaging them ourselves because it is a lot more powerful uh, to receive a message from you know the CEO of a company than it is uh, or a VP engineering or something else than it is from um, a recruiter because people think that you care and the, the yeah. company cares. And um, these are one-on-one -on -one outreaches. Correct. One-on-one -on -one outreaches because um, the, the worst thing you can do to your brand is to scattershot. I found is that you know sending a thousand outreaches yeah. that are impersonalized. What does that outreach sound like? I, I'm proactively reaching out to someone. I have no idea if they're looking for a job. I have no idea if they're happy in their job. They don't know who mm -hmm. I am. They don't know who my company is. Mm -hmm. What is the gist of that outreach that you found will get them to say, "Huh, yeah, I'll have a conversation." So it, it has to. The ingredients are actually quite simple. The ingredients are that you have spent. A, literally a modicum of time understanding who this person is and what they what they care about. So being able to not just have a generic, hey, engineer X or salesperson X, uh, please, are you interested in this job? It's uh, being able to have a single sentence that says, hey, I noticed you do this, or I noticed you're interested in this. So for example, in our early days hiring software engineers, we would say, um, hey, I saw you contributed to this GitHub repository. That's really interesting and linking that to what you're doing and saying, I think you'll find what we're doing interesting for the following reasons, yeah. would love to have a chat. Literally that two line message has had the best conversion of anything we've ever done. Got it. But this is, I, now I see why you're spending half your time on this. You're customizing messages based on individual profiles to a shitload of people. Well, the thing is you don't need that much volume if you do it this way. So would you rather spend uh, non-custom messages to 100 or custom messages to 20? And so the uh, question becomes, um, you know, do you want to be the uh, airstrike or the sniper model? Right. And what, what we found is that um, the, it's kind of the kind of company you want to be. And for us, uh, we wanted to be known for uh, being personalized, being targeted, uh, going after very specific people that we thought would be great. And I think, um, it, especially if you're hiring for high skill, people want to see that you care. So we talked about earlier that, Candidates want to see value before uh, being asked for something. Uh, you know, it's that and, principle. And, and, and give us an example when you say value. They want to see value. Please tell me you're not talking about content with a free PDF or something. <laughs> no, I'm, I want, I'm talking about the fact that uh, you are showing them that you understand them and the fact that you're not reaching out to them as a transaction. You know, that you are uh, actually someone that is interested in what they're interested in. And I think the other thing is... Uh, and having just a, a small amount of sophistication around um, what for different roles, what people care about. So for example, with um, the technical side of the business with software engineers, they really, uh, they like learning. And so what the reach out should contain is uh, this is why what we're working on is interesting and what you could learn. Um, 
in the commercial side of the organization, it's often, uh, the, it's learning, but in a different way. It's the kind of customers you get to work with. Yeah. It's the kind of uh, things that you get to do that you didn't get to do before. And the so potential. You're going to make a shitload of money. Correct, as well. Um, but they, they want some validation in that because you have to remember that the really, really in-demand people obviously have a, a lot of this happening. And so um, what's really satisfying is being able to have someone say, I get 100 of these messages a day. You're the only one I'll respond yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. So what if, this is fascinating, what have you learned about the, the, the cycle time? So when you talk about CRM, you have a sales cycle, right? From the time mm -hmm. of that first outreach to the time you sign the $500,000 contract with that customer. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about statistically, which I'm sure you track because you sound pretty metrics obsessed, <laughs> um, the, kind of that first outreach from you at home on your couch, looking at GitHub profiles and sending messages to the time that person joins the company. I know it's a large distribution, I know it's a bell curve, but how early do I need to dig my well before I'm thirsty? So let me answer um, slightly from reverse. If you think about the candidate life cycle, um, and you talk to most companies and most jobs, uh, the proverbial time to hire from the moment a job opens up to the moment you fill it is usually around 60 to 90 days, depending mm -hmm. on the complexity. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about how much of that is the interview process, it's about two weeks. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying, out of a 90-day time to hire, what are the other 76 days? And the other 76 days are the time to find and time to engage. Right. And so the point is, if you were able to turn that 76 days into 20, 15, because you've already engaged that person, because you've already um, interacted with them and they're already interested, uh, and then it becomes, sure, I'll come interview with you. Uh, the, the productivity gain and the value of that is huge. Uh, as an example, I think there's a general industry principle that there's someone's value to the business is about three to four X the annual salary. And so um, you know, shaving that off can be you know, tens of thousands of dollars per person uh, per role that you fill. Mm -hmm. As to come back to the original question, um, how much time in advance, uh, it, it depends on... Um, the amount of and volume of roles that you have. So right. the lead cycle can be uh, typically from a couple of months to six months. What we found is, you know, let's say you're doing some campus recruiting. Um, you, you should be building relationships with people a year or two before they graduate because right. by the time that they're graduating, they already have been being bombarded with a whole right. bunch of You need to think about how far do I need to go upstream mm -hmm. relative to how far upstream other companies are going and my competitors. Exactly. And also based on how scarce that role is. Mm -hmm. and, how, and to your point, how many I hire, right? So if I'm, if most of my hiring is software developers or most of my hiring is sales reps, mm -hmm. that's where I should focus my time, right? Exactly. And there's, there's a cyclicality to it. So for example, sales reps is a really good example. Uh, typically sales reps, um, wait till the end of quarter till they get paid their commission till they leave. Sure. And so, and so you, you want to be starting one or two quarters in advance to try and understand, are they going to have a good year? Are they happy with their, with their at? And being able to anticipate that, um, if the quarter end is in March, you're not going to hire them in March. They're going to wait till April to see right. what happens. Right. And there is a natural cycle time to it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I have to imagine our listeners are still a little skeptical about their ability to invest this kind of time. Uh, it's kind of hard to argue with the logic of it, right? Mm -hmm. And I totally get it. But these people are running companies, they're running businesses, they're running departments. And you're saying mm -hmm. spend half your time on this, spend your weekends and evenings emailing strangers from LinkedIn and GitHub mm -hmm. to, and take a shitload of, I'm sure, informational interviews or very, you know, very low probability kind of meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you convince someone that's skeptical that the, they got to take a leap of faith, right? that this is gonna pay off. What data can you point to? What examples do you have? Anything that can make someone say, well, it worked for them, it should work for me. Well, I think in, I actually don't think people um, would be as skeptical. It's one of those things, you know, every, Every CEO of a Fortune 100 says, you know, people are my biggest priority. And so I think it's one of those cognitive dissonance points. If, 
you realize that to your business people are important and they are really important. Uh, surely investing a proportional amount of time in your people is, uh, is the right thing to, to do. And I think the, the other piece obviously is um, there's plenty of data on what the right hire is and the value they produce, you know, bad hires uh, losing kind of months or even years of productivity. And so I think it's, you've got to ask yourself you know, what kind of business you are, what kind of business you want to be. And you know, sometimes uh, if you're very capital intensive, if you're uh, maybe people are not as much of an asset to you as, uh, as in other organizations, but I think it's, it should be kind of fairly self-explanatory there. And obviously, you know, as a shameless plug, um, there are, there is software out there that makes these things a little bit easier and a little bit more automated. So let's do that now. So get, give us an overview of Beamery and what pieces of the process it handles versus what you really need a human to do. Sure, that's, uh, that's a great question. Um, so fundamentally, the, the people and the processes that we talked about for the last kind of uh, 10, 15 minutes is what you need to do first. And so the, the last part is to be able to say, well, where do we uh, store all that data? How do we actually build those pipelines? And, and it's, a, it's a very similar analogy to something like salesforce.com. You don't need the product until you have a sales team, and until you know who you're, uh, who you're selling to, and until you do all these things. But it enables you to then have um, Organize your data and data governance, organize your processes uh, to be unified and one directional, and then be able to use all of that to make everyone uh, do the same thing uh, to the same level of quality, uh, speed, and being able to then forecast and report on it. So our product has uh, a few key components. We have a core CRM product uh, that allows you to do that. We have a core marketing uh, product that is essentially all of the uh, employer brand management, um, communication and messaging, and uh, CMS pieces. Uh, we actually have a compliance tool for things like uh, GDPR compliance to be able to enable you to, to own that and a connectivity layer that uh, integrates with pretty much every other um, HR and uh, recruiting system that you use to be able to create that unified data set. And does this make sense once I reach a certain size in, or stage in my company, whether it's revenue, people, whatever? <laughs> Uh, it, it starts to make sense once you start actually building a formal talent acquisition team because uh, it's, as you say, it's really difficult to get executives or business leaders uh, to go and learn another tool and uh, live somewhere else. So that's not part of their day job. Um, I think once you start saying, okay, recruitment is actually a strategic asset and you're probably hiring maybe close to hundred people a year at that point. That's when it becomes relevant. Got it. I understand. So you've hit that inflection point. You're on a growth trajectory where hiring is, is a crucial thing. That's when it makes sense to get a product like this. Yes. Yeah, so and when it becomes a bit more, you know how many people you're going to hire and you have yeah. very specific targets around it. Abacar, this is fantastic. How can people learn more about Beamery or get in touch with you? Uh, absolutely. So uh, beamery.com, uh, B-E-A-M-E-R-Y is, uh, is our website. Uh, has a lot of information, obviously, about our products. Uh, you can you know, request a demo, uh, get in touch with our, um, our commercial team there. So uh, you know, we'd, love to, uh, we'd love for you to get in touch. I give you so much credit because this is really, you're, you're really trying to evangelize and change the way that people hire, right? And as you know, when you try to create a movement, it's really freaking hard. I, I implore uh, our listener to take this seriously, whether you use Beamery or not, which I, I think is as good as it gets. You have to dig your well before you're thirsty or you are hosed. Abhikar, thank you so much for making the time today. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff, for having me.